Silicon Valley Bank, or SVB, feels like something that came and went and everything is all okay now. But that's not really true because it's a symptom. Silicon Valley Bank and what happened there is a symptom of broader things that are happening in the world right now. This presentation, first of all, tells you a little bit about how Star Trader operates in order to set a context for Silicon Valley Bank. Then it goes into the broader financial markets and from that into what happened at Silicon Valley Bank. Then we have some talk about the effect on other assets, gold and forex, how Silicon Valley Bank affects those things and how we should think about banks when we invest and so forth. And finally, it's a big thank you for joining me on this show today. It's, um, it's quite a big thing. So if we start off with a couple of words about um, Star Trader, then Star Trader has been growing very quickly over the past uh, two years. Uh, if we look at the last 12 months, then we've shifted from a situation where we have offices for where maybe two or three out of eight people in the world live into a situation where we now have offices where approximately five billion out of eight billion people in the world live. So that's a big, 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 big change for us. We're moving very quickly. And in terms of payment methods, um, we have about 200 different payment methods now. And that's complex. Um, what we do is we look at a new market that we're interested in. We work out which additional payment methods we need in order to support those markets. And once we've done that, we quickly integrate those payment methods into our current systems. Then we go back and we do process mining so that we understand how we can optimize and make things as quick as possible. When our customers want to make withdrawals, they want them to be quick. So we always try to improve the speed. When we want additional payment methods, we try to add those as quickly as we can do. And also when people want to make deposits, if they see an opportunity, then it's important that it's quick. It needs to be easy to make a deposit and then place a trade. Those are things that our customers expect. So we have ongoing work on this all the time. It's actually quite advanced. If you imagine 200 payment methods, money coming in from different places, money going out to different places all the time, it's actually quite an advanced thing that our teams are doing, both on a technical level and also on a financial control level. So um, also during the last 12 months, we've seen a, a new area of business happen for us, which is institutional business. So we have so many buy, sell, buy, buy, sell, sell orders coming through all the time right now that big companies are choosing to use us as the platform on which they do their business. This means that we need to do very advanced stress testing on our systems. We need to be able to predict where the risks might come from. Um, these big institutional clients come to us partly because of the liquidity or the uh, depth of market that we have, uh, partly because we are technically quite good apparently, um, we have low latency on what we do, and also risk management and capital. Capital, they know that if they make a withdrawal then we have the money to pay, so that's good. And risk management is something difficult and advanced, something we work very much on, and we give training to institutional clients on risk management. Okay, so those are all things in our little world. Now, let's go from there into a market where we are not present today. We are not um, acting in the United States or North America. That's not our business. We focus on other markets. Okay, let's look at Silicon Valley Bank. Well, a starting point is real-time reporting. And according to BlackRock, um, in terms of the long-term assets held by Silicon Valley Bank, a lot of those reports associated with those things were not real-time. They were delayed by a week or two or something, which can make a big difference. I'll show you why in a moment. Before we dig into Silicon Valley Bank, let's start by just looking at the big picture. Okay, over the last 10-15 years, we've had incredible quantitative easing 
going into the marketplace. That quantitative easing has landed money in banks, and the big idea was that the quantitative easing would go into companies, so the companies would make investments and the economy would keep rolling despite times being difficult. It hasn't worked out exactly like that because the money has gone into banks, true. However, over the last 10, 15 years, largely the interest rates by central banks have been very, very low. And consequently, the QE money, the quantitative easing money, has been used as security for providing loans, which has magnified the amount of money coming out very much. And because there's so much money coming out, it has not mainly gone into investment. It has to some extent gone into investment. It's mainly gone into housing and shares. What we're seeing today is that a small amount of that money, a small percentage of that money, is shifting, is shifting out from housing, real estate and shares. A small percentage of a big number goes into things that drive infl inflation. So consumer price index going up in most countries right now, CPI. That drive into inflation is something that the central banks look very hard at because they have two main um, obligations. One is to keep inflation in reasonable shape and the other thing is to keep the financial industry in reasonable shape. Conflicting tasks. Those are actually quite difficult to manage for a central bank. So the central banks have tried to raise the interest rates in order to keep down inflation, um, but um, quantitative easing is not quantitative tightening in reverse. It's not symmetric, which means that when the central banks have increased the interest rates, quite often companies have been hit or banks have been hit. It's a bit more complicated than first intended. And we are in no man's territory here. No one knows how to do this. The most clever minds are in the big central banks and it's new. And it's from an artificial intelligence standpoint, modeling this is incredibly difficult because there is no prior data. No one knows how to do this. This is totally new. Difficult, difficult, difficult times are where we are. So the Fed has increased its central banks, uh, its interest rates step by step. Now let's look at the banks. Uh, how do banks work? Well, um, it's not a very lucrative business in the past 12 months. And the reason is that the banks have deposits where they pay a small interest to the depositors. And then they have income because they use a lot of that money in order to buy long-term bonds. And the value of the long-term bonds or the um, uh, money that you get from the long-term bonds is slightly higher than the deposits. And that little difference is a place to try to live. But it's very tight. The margins are very, very, very tight. Very small differences between these things. So now let's go into Silicon Valley Bank for a moment. And um, we have a bank that has grown very quickly over the last few years. Huge deposits in the Bay Area um, from startup companies and from venture capital firms primarily. That type of world, highly connected, high speed, high risk ventures. Those are the primary places where the deposits have come from. And Silicon Valley Bank bought long-term bonds where typically the yield was in the area of 1.64%. Now 1.64% a couple of years ago was a good percentage, but it's not a good percentage now. I think we all recognize that. In early 2021, the Chief Financial Officer Daniel Beck um, uh, made statements um, to the effect that the potential for increased interest rates from central banks are covered off. There are various hedges and so forth to protect the bank. 2022 ended up being a difficult year, partly because venture capital became very careful. So the companies that deposited into Silicon Valley Bank 
were companies who found it more difficult to raise capital, which meant that as they burned through cash, they spent the money and the deposits started declining and drying up a little bit. Um, venture capital firms also very, very careful with their money during 2022. Tough private capital markets. And um, Silicon Valley Bank had its own problems. In, on April 29th, the chief risk officer departed from the company. And in the second quarter of 2022, Silicon Valley Bank started selling a lot of their um, available um, uh, funds, available long-term funds, AFSs, in order to boost profits. And in August 2022, the CEO, Greg Becker, tried to calm the markets by making statements along the lines of, we know what we're doing, don't worry. Okay, I get that, I get that, I fully get that. However, um, it didn't quite work out that way. Um, in the beginning of this year, Silicon Valley Bank had a new chief risk officer and they concluded that they needed to raise more money. And then we have a couple of dramatic days. This was fast. On Wednesday the 8th of March, after the stock markets had already closed, Silicon Valley Bank made the statement that they need to raise money. And as a part of raising money, they disclosed that they had sold their interest rate hedges at a considerable loss. Big, big change. Okay, um, you can see on this chart that the price of gold was perhaps affected by these changes. You can see the time space here where these announcements were made. And on Thursday the 9th of March, the stock market went down. Share price down 60% in one day. And the technically very capable customers or depositors of Silicon Valley Bank started swiping out money on that Thursday very quickly. They literally swiped $42 billion out of the deposits at Silicon Valley Bank during one day. That's an amazing number. It's, it's such a big number. And Canaan, Q2, Union Square Ventures and Founders Fund allegedly advised their clients to withdraw money. Big venture capital firms said, okay, we're not so comfortable with this. So, okay, um, Silicon Valley Bank in big, big trouble. And cyber herds started looking for soft prey, people shorting. If you look at Euro USD, you can see huge volatility in that time period. Um, maybe there's a flight to the dollar afterwards, I don't know. It's um, for you guys to decide, I don't give advice. And on Friday the 10th of March, bang! Um, the share price down a further 69% in one day and ultimately the regulators stepped in and um, it was time um, for the California Department of Financial Protection and Innovation to appoint FDIC as a receiver. All of that happened on that Friday. Big things. In the morning of that day, the CEO, Greg Becker, um, very smart guy, said, come on, if you can just hang in there, um, things will be all right. But the credibility was gone and Silicon Valley Bank went down. Okay, that's three days. Wednesday evening for the first disclosure, Thursday for a big market crash, money out. Friday for a further market crash and the receivers were appointed. Very quick and fast movement. So why am I going through this? Well, um, 
first of all, as a trader, let's remember there is money and there is volatility in, in the market, which means that this is a good time to trade. However, when we think about these banks, we cannot think about these banks as being disconnected. These banks are part of our daily lives. So it's not possible to let them fail easily. Maybe sometimes they should be allowed to fail, but more typically what happens is that uh, governments step in and help out in some, different, in some way. In the case of Silicon Valley Bank, the shareholders took a big beating. In the case of Credit Suisse, the um, bondholders first took a big beating and then the shareholders. I don't understand the logics there in the case of Credit Suisse. I, it's not clear to me why that would be reversed for Credit Suisse. But that's not for me to say. I'll leave that unsaid at this time. My point is that when banks fail, they don't fail in the ways that we're used to when other companies fail. What we do know is that 2023 and 2024 will have a lot of volatility. We've already seen that. And there's new volatility coming in. And this slide is uh, just to inject a little bit of fun. Um, in 2022, for the first time, I think, we had a significant influence in the market from celebrities, where celebrities are endorsing various assets. That's a new trend. Um, personally, um, I play tennis um, often and badly, and I would love it if Naomi Osaka would teach me how to snap my forehand more efficiently and how to get a better kick serve. However, politely and generously, Naomi, I love your tennis, but I don't look for financial advice from you because you're not trained on finance. So this is a new world for me, and um, I think it's quite interesting. I think we're going to see more of this, um, more of celebrities uh, in different ways influencing some given assets. We also see more volatility and more money coming in from the United States in the form of the 1.2 trillion Infrastructure Act. Uh, we have $280 billion being printed for the CHIPS Act. We had $400 billion on top of that being printed uh, in order to curb inflation, which is a little bit counterintuitive to me. Um, these things seem a bit conflicting. From a trader's perspective, wonderful, because this drives more money into the market, and it also means that the volatility is there so that people can actually make money. So all in all, um, I think there is money in 2023. I think 2023 belongs to traders. 2024 is the same. Uh, I think that's where it's going to head. I don't know. Um, I think we're seeing volatility. I think we're seeing money coming from all the markets. Uh, the big message is that mm -hmm, this definitely looks like a great time to be a trader. For Silicon Valley Bank, I don't think that this is the end of problems in the market. And the reason I don't think this is the end of problems in the market is because the picture we're looking at is one which is incredibly complicated. A lot of money is out there. It's driving inflation. And the difficulty in pulling back that money has been made obvious by the demise of Silicon Valley Bank and a couple of surrounding banks as well. So all in all, um, I think the conclusion is um, get an account um, and see how you feel about the financial markets. Uh, we have a couple of different planets you can land on if you want to start doing that. And um, there are two main methods by which you can join us. Um, either you join us in order to trade. Um, a simple demo account simply needs an email address and a password, but if you want to feel how it is to be a real trader, then do provide a proof of identity, proof of address, so that you can open up a real account. If you're a partner, and if you want to use Star Trader as the environment in which you do your business, it's much more customized, much more detailed. So um, please do get in touch, and you will have a dedicated account manager to help you define where you are now, where you want to go, that journey, how you can build the type of business that you want to do. So yeah, we're ready. Join us now. I think Silicon Valley Bank is an example of 
the sort of thing that enables incredible trading during 2023 and 2024. It's a fascinating world and it's certainly not ended yet. Thank you.